So now accelerating the transition to zero carbon, please welcome to the stage moderator Bill Brandt of ASU Lightworks. He'll also be joined by his ASU colleague Klaus Lochner and Ellen Stutchel. Also on the stage is Cheryl Martin of Harwich Partners. They've done quite a bit of uh, hard research on how to take carbon out of the air. I'm sure we'll be able to hear a lot about their uh, processes and how they've really devoted a school, ASU Lightworks, to this type of cutting edge research. Klaus, nice to see you again. Well, good morning, everybody. And Welcome to the second panel on the energy or the transition to net zero carbon. So uh, did any of you get a chance to go out and uh, take a short walk this morning? Anybody? All right, a couple people, right. Well, I have a dog and she takes me out. So I went out this morning and looked over to the west and there was this amazing moon set as the sun was coming up and I was just going, oh my gosh. And I forgot my cell phone. So I'm like going, okay, I've got five minutes to go back home, get my cell phone, come back out, and take that Instagram-like picture. So I came back out, and I walked up to the place where the moon was, and it was gone. <laughs> I'm like going, oh my gosh. I'm used to thinking of, I have five minutes to get a sunset or a moonset when the mountains are 30 miles away, but not when they're two miles away. So I began to realize that that was a situation where I was sort of thinking traditionally by past experience, and here we are where I needed to be realizing I needed to move much faster and move quickly. So the purpose of this discussion is to sort of talk about, well, okay, uh, we know that we have to move quicker and faster, so how do we begin thinking about doing it so we don't get caught in the same place where I was, where I was thinking, I have five minutes for that Instagram picture, and I missed it. So, you know, we've had a wonderful discussion here in the last two days. Uh, some of the points that came out of the conference so far is activation is a key need. Wes Clark, in his opening remarks, talked about how do we find ways for people to get in and activate and actually start moving rather than just worrying about things? Photovoltaics and wind, uh, now the low cost energy, or you could think of them as primary energy. We heard about the need for storage. We heard about how in Australia there's taking steps to actually say we need to think differently about how we're going to solve energy, including hydrogen. We talked a little bit about ammonia, and we talked about how we might actually use this amazing energy system that we currently have. We also talked a little bit about how we can de-risk some of that technology, because although the markets are really interested in saying, you know, I'd like to do green, but I want to make money, there's a question of how we de-risk this pipeline. And so can we think about how we accelerate innovation and get to manufacturing at a scale like our current automobile industry. So those are some things that we've been talking about this and what we hope this panel will do is investigate these ideas in a little more detail and leave you with some thoughts or ideas about what we're gonna do with a big market, how we're gonna reuse and recycle and use our existing system and how we're gonna need more players to get in and de-risk so that we can actually get to scale. So um, on the panel here, I have uh, starting with Cheryl Martin, who's uh, returned to the United States after three years as a member of the managing board of the World Economic Forum, where she was responsible for a range of business and innovation initiatives. Previously, Cheryl served as the acting director of ARPA-E and respons was responsible as the deputy director also for commercializing their tech to market program. Ellen Stetchel, who's next to Cheryl, is a professor of practice at ASU and a co-director of ASU Lightworks. Ellen's built a career on science and technology within both basic and applied research with uh, opportunities to um, work at Sandia National Laboratory and Ford Motor Company, amongst other things. Klaus Lochner, who's seated here to my immediate right, uh, is a professor at ASU, uh, leading the Center for Negative Carbon Emissions. Klaus is a trained theoretical physicist, worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory, 
uh, was at Columbia University and now Arizona State University. Klaus's research interests include uh, closing the carbon cycle. So what I'd like to do is uh, get my panelists to talk for a few minutes about their ideas on this theme, and we'll start with Klaus. Well, thank you. I, I really, by the way, liked your analogy about the moonset. Right? In a way, physical systems don't wait for us, and the, the more I think about it, we, we poked nature very hard by a large injection of greenhouse gases, and now the consequences will unfold at a time scale we have actually very little control over. And I, I would like to begin by pointing out we are actually way too late. Uh, if, you, if you look at it from the, and I think this became really clear recently when you read the 1.5 degree report of the IPCC. And to put it in very simple terms, if you want to stop at 450 ppm, it's not so hard to figure out what that will take. We are at 410, 412 now. We are going up about two and a half ppm a year. And if we decelerate, if we slow down every year by a fixed percentage, we will eventually level out somewhere. So you can now say, okay, how much do we have to level, come down every year to stop at 450? It turns out right now the world's carbon intensity has to be reduced every year by 9% uh, in order to make that happen. If we keep talking about it till 2025, it's going to be 14% every year we have to do. We have about 15 years left before we hit the 450 mark, which is slightly above, as it turns out, the one and a half degree uh, level we are talking about. I think we have reached a point where it's very clear that things have to change very, very rapidly. We are probably have to admit we are living in an overshoot regime. We will overshoot. We have to come back at the back end. And th that means, in plain language, we cannot avoid storage anymore. We have to figure out how to get rid of excess carbon. If we want to go back to 350 ppm, we will have to put 60 parts per million of CO2 away. More likely, this will sound like 100 parts per million, and we may very well come back from 500 to 400 rather than from 500 to 350. So that scale, we will have to find storage for. And in the meantime, uh, it will take us a while to solve the problem. I think we have to start thinking differently about fossil carbon coming out of the ground. It produces a waste product called CO2. And this is a waste management problem, first and foremost. It's great to have a way of recycling it. It's great to have a way of reusing it. But if you haven't quite figured this out yet, you don't have the excuse to say, oh, and by the way, since I didn't figure it out, it goes in the atmosphere. This is the dump where it always went. So we have to stop that. So we have to figure out how to solve this problem. And I, I would argue we, at this point, have very little choice but figuring out how to get carbon back from the environment. I personally work on direct air capture because I think of all the, the options on the table, it is by far the most scalable. I would, would put it a different way. If you look at the sheer scale of the problem, if you wanted to have biomass pull it back, yes, you can, but your, your land demand is larger than current agriculture. At the same time, you probably will have to feed 10 billion people. You also have to make sure that the energy infrastructure we have doesn't collapse on you during the transition. So you have to do this in a careful, measured way, and you have to figure out how to solve this problem. My own contribution is there. On the other hand, I'm actually quite optimistic from the technology side by looking at renewable energy. I think we are living in a world, I have an analogy, we, we are running on a big yard or, or a cruise ship, and we have realized that we, we are pumping cooling water onto the engine and then just leave it in the bottom of the ship, and we have to do something about it. We have to take it out, right? And we have to pump it out. And by the way, we can't turn the engine off because we have to pump it out. So first thing is we better get it overboard and, <laughs> and put it away. And yes, it would be very great to desalinate some of that water and have drinking water on board of the ship, but that's not my first concern. We are listing. We have to get that water out. So here, too, we have to stop putting the CO2 into the atmosphere. We have to figure that out immediately. We have very few years left, and we have to keep doing this probably for the next 50, 60 years, simply to get back to a safe territory. In the meantime, we will have done real damage. But the optimistic part is we have now renewable energy. 
And I would argue photovoltaic energy in the meantime has gotten to a price where it is close to comp not just competing, I think it will tip over in the next couple of years, in the next few years, that solar energy, photovoltaic energy, is actually cheaper than what you can do with a, photo, with a, with a fossil fuel plant. And that's not when the fossil fuel plant just pays for its, its levelized cost, but actually the dispatch costs. Solar energy in midday will stop fossil carbon plants from running. And that will be a revolution. We have to figure out how to do that in a stable manner. And I think one of the things it does is it makes you start thinking about photovoltaic energy not as something which goes into the electric grid, but being truly primary energy. So a large fraction of it actually will not get into the power grid because the power grid doesn't know how to handle it, but instead makes hydrogen. That hydrogen we can, can convert with the CO2 we are taking out of the atmosphere anyhow into liquid fuels. Those technologies have been around <coughs> since the 1920s. They have never been used, petroleum was too cheap. But when we put a price on carbon, this becomes competitive. And at that point, we can actually have energy in Boston all winter in the form of natural gas, which came from West Texas, from New Mexico or Arizona, because these places have the sunshine to be the most competitive in making that electricity work. So from that perspective, I see that we have a real opportunity to make it work. And also with direct air capture, we are bringing in individuals. If you think about it, we all came here somehow. Many of us used cars, many of us used planes. We better get that CO2 back. And having a button at the pump where I can say, for 20, 30 cents extra, I'll get my CO2 back, might very well be a start before regulators figured it out. This is how we started recycling, and this is how we stopped littering. So maybe we can do this again, <laughs> except this time on a much larger scale. Right. Thanks, Klaus. Ellen. Um, okay, uh, I wanted to try to pick up on a few things that we've heard uh, through the week, and also, but to start with the title of this um, panel. Uh, Bill, you might not have noticed, but Bill changed the title when he introduced it, and he changed it in a very important way. He said accelerating the transition to net zero carbon. And picking up on what Klaus said is what we really need is uh, acceleration. That picks up on the theme of we're out of time. And as Klaus very eloquently put, we are completely out of time. And so it's not just net zero, it's net negative. And that's uh, part of what Klaus was, a uh, point he was making, and I, I couldn't agree more. But in doing that, and uh, we've heard throughout the, uh, the week that you know it's not just energy, it's more than energy. Uh, so we have to begin with the end in mind. And the importance of uh, net zero is carbon is not the problem. <laughs> I mean, uh, as I've said before, carbon is a miraculous element. And the only other miraculous element on the, uh, more miraculous element on the periodic ta table is hydrogen. So we cannot live without carbon and hydrogen. It's all of the natural world and a lot of the inorganic world. And we can do more. So the problem is not carbon. The problem is not hydrocarbons. As uh, Klaus just said, we can make hydrocarbons and we can make them net neutral. We can make some of them uh, to burn so we can keep our uh, planes and the two billion vehicles running. We can smooth the transition from old to new, because uh, as Klaus also said, we have to do this without disrupting the economy. We have to uh, somehow, we love creative destruction, but we don't like disruptive, catastrophic things happening while we're creatively destruct destructing the old system and creating the new. So oil and gas companies are not the problem, auto companies are not the problem, air travel's not the problem, meat's not the problem. We have to solve the problem of balancing the carbon cycle. And uh, in the spirit of um, what Amory Lovins was saying of integrated design, we have to begin with the end in mind, uh, what is the problem we're solving? All too often, the best way to solve a problem is to redefine 
or reimagine what is the problem we're really solving, because oftentimes, I think it was Dean Kamen who said it, we solve solutions, we don't solve problems. And by rethinking what is the problem we're really trying to solve, we find really big levers. And uh, there's also a, um, you know, in that systems thinking, when we optimize at a subsystem level, like uh, Amory said, if we just try to make the engine a little more efficient rather than lightweighting the vehicle, we're optimizing at a subsystem and therefore you suboptimize at the full system. So s system thinking and finding big levers. So another thing that was said this week that I loved <laughs> is making the impossible possible. As physicists, I still believe in, you know, unless it tri truly uh, violates the laws of physics. But er very often times, it isn't that we violate the physics. When we're making the, the impossible possible is we found an artificial constraint to remove. We've, um, I think it's uh, Amory said, you know, like the, the, the dot problem, getting outside of the box, okay, rethinking the constraints uh, is how we make the impossible possible. So uh, we said it also uh, in, the, in the panel yesterday, it was said, what, uh, what changed in uh, making hydrogen more real today? Um, I don't know if, uh, how many people saw the, uh, the movie on Wednesday night, The Age of Hydrogen. Well, that movie was actually made 15 years ago. <laughs> And 15 years ago, or two decades ago, we were very enthusiastic about the hydrogen economy, and we thought we were on the verge until there was, well, we need four miracles. Well, now, in the interim, a lot of things have changed, but now we are on the verge of having made the impossible possible, those four miracles, and we have a quiet revolution going with hydrogen. Um, so, in the spirit of the title, Accelerating, as uh, Bill, with his beautiful analogy, and Klaus said, we're out of time. So, but disruptive innovations, innovations all along, along the pipeline, they do take time. There's nothing we can do about it. They, they take time, but we have to start accelerating. We can't stop innovating. We have to start deploying existing innovations and keep innovating. But we do have a few levers to take advantage of in accelerating. We've always found throughout history um, that it takes about two decades to get, uh, get innovations from the lab, even into early deployment, getting it de-risked. We fall into all kinds of valley of deaths. So a lot of what we heard about you know, from Prime uh, is great. You know, finding you know financing for to get across some of those valley of deaths, but still it takes time. But some of the um, disruptive technologies that we can take advantage of, some of that making the impossible possible, are things like ubiquitous computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, rapid prototyping, the Internet of Things. It, it seems we are on the verge of some serious disruptive technologies that at least we can start accelerating, not, not taking four decades uh, to get to scale. But uh, from the lab, can we do better than two decades? I don't know. <laughs> but we do need to accelerate. And we need to accelerate innovations all along the pipeline. So on integrative uh, design thinking, we, um, when I was trained at Ford Motor Company, we called that value engineering. I, I'm not sure if it's exactly the same, but it has a lot of the same principles. You know, begin at the end. What is the problem? What is the service that we're trying to provide? And rethink, can we do that differently with less resources? Um, Another statement that was made uh, that I also <laughs> uh, got me thinking, everyone wants to change the world, no one wants to change. Well, I would just tweak that a little bit. It's no one wants to make sacrifices, no one wants to take risks. Some of those may be perceived, 
We used to say perception is reality. I like to say perception drives reality. But if people are perceiving it's a sacrifice or it's a loss, we call this no takeaways. We're going to try and re-envision how do we get to sustainable mobility. No takeaways. And also, it's not just a utility. What a lot of people, what we found uh, through a lot of uh, social uh, research is it's, it, it's the experience, not just the service, not just the utility. So net zero, net zero, uh, negative versus, uh, so a lot of, and I think what one of the things Klaus said is it's the fossil carbon we have to uh, eliminate. A lot of that is avoiding emissions. There's conservation, less of the service. People don't usually like that. Efficiency is the same service, the same purpose, the same experience, or better yet, a better experience, but with less resources. And that's what we need to get to. The gold standard on storage is still liquid hydrocarbons. Not necessarily a bad thing. And I think I'm probably out of time, so I'll stop. Thanks, Ellen. That was terrific. Uh, Cheryl. Um, awesome. Thank you. Thanks for being here, um, inviting me to come. Um, so I came to, um, to RPE and my roles in government from 20 years in industry. And so for me, the mantra when I went into RPE was, um, if it works, will it matter? And I think that's really everything that we're talking about here. So we're willing to take very big bets, but they had to actually matter. There's a lot of things that get proposed that for a lot of different reasons, even if we scaled them up, they wouldn't make a big dent in things. And I think you have to be bold to say, will these things matter? But once you decide they matter, you have to figure out how to accelerate them. And so when we were at, um, how many people have heard of RPE? The Advanced Research Projects <laughs> Agency, it's modeled after DARPA, um, intended its 10-year-old agency. Very special um, hiring authority. People come in three years, um, so 1,000 days to change the world. And it reduces bureaucratic drag, because you're out after 1,000 days. <laughs> and so um, it's been very successful, I think, so far. Um, $2 billion of R&D money has gone out to researchers all over the United States. They've seen $2.9 billion, at least, in publicly announced follow-on funding, as well as 76 new companies. Um, and I think that those types of things, thinking about, well, how are you going to measure this long path to market, are important. But when I went in, the reason I went in was not because of the cool technology. Like, it's awesome, and I'm not going to talk about that. But the whole idea of the technology to market. And so how do you take early ideas and actually get them ready to go and get them accelerating? You actually have to put time and money. And we were fortunate at the agency that by congressional mandate, we had to use 10%, 5, 5 to 10% of the funding of the grant for tech to market activity. And that changes the game because you have conversations with researchers where you go to give them that $2 million three-year grant check, and you hold one end and they hold the other, and you say to them, what happens at month 37? What happens when we're done with this money? You start to actually have a conversation. How far will you get if it goes well? What happens if it doesn't go well? Are you still in the research phase? Do you need a demonstration phase? Where would the ecosystem go next? Where would you need it to go? And we're, at, we're talking about things that are totally out of the box, you know, high altitude wind turbines or um, batteries with no metals in them. And so you're asking the ecosystem of other government agencies, of companies, of other startups to actually buy in to help something that, that is impossible, like often um, impossible ideas. You need to bring them along in the process. So along these three years, we would bring people together with us and as side of the looking at this whole you know, space, we'd say, well, who matters at which point in time? If you bring the venture people in really early and they think you're pitching to them, they've already heard that story now and they might have soured on it. Well, maybe you bring in a venture person to talk about what will matter and why certain things will matter two years from now. You bring in um, other government agencies. If it's going to be a bug or a plant that's going to generate fuel, we probably ought to have USDA in there, our Department of Defense, right? Um, that's how I got to know Jim Goodrow. We brought in the, the Navy folks, right? How are we going to bring these things together? But you have to have an ecosystem that can diligence in flight. Because as we change from the impossible to the plausible, it only moves to inevitable if the ecosystem moves too. And so I lived in that world for four years. As I, um, as I ran the tech-to-market program, we spun it up, and I started 
actually running the agency to say, how do we do this? How do we identify the players? And I think we did a really good job that 2.9 billion of follow-on is not an accident. Those people didn't just tumble in, right? But you have to be able to paint pictures of possible markets and realistic timeframes before they can step in. You have to help them understand what's going on because you have technical risk and market risk, especially in energy. And acting as an agency sometimes to say, well, we better start a conversation that if this works, these policies are gonna have to change. We're gonna invest in bugs. Well, bugs aren't plants, and every renewable fuel standard's written for plants. Now, the bugs can make enough fuel to fit in the palm of my hand, but you gotta start somewhere, and you gotta move these things, and you have to have conversations, because it's a long process. And so, I spent a lot of time doing that, and I think we've got some really interesting examples, but along the way, one of the things that struck me is, we, we don't have, I don't think we have an inbound idea problem, and I don't think we have a large capital market problem. There's, a, there's almost too much capital. I think we've marketed it to death because we have so much capital. It's green and it's, it's ESG and it's, you know, it's got all these labels and I don't think they speak to each other very well. So I think that could use some simplifying. We have a middle of the pipe problem where we're actually not able to get the demonstrations done in a way that actually brings capital back in. And I think that's because we're not doing enough on the ecosystem around the middle of the pipe. Right, we wanna say, well, venture and everybody, venture doesn't work or venture's not, they won't wanna do hard tech. Well, the venture model's difficult for these things. So why keep trying to make that hammer work on, on this thing that, that needs some other tool? And so I've been trying to actually look at and think about how do you have different ways of thinking about middle of the pipe capital. And so RPE itself is looking at reaching out further to do some larger demonstration projects where 50-50 matches with private capital. Could be awesome, could not be awesome if, well, because I think one of the problems is we count on corporates, and I believe firmly, coming from corporate, that corporations are gonna be the thing that get this scaled, but a corporate and the person who can help define a project to go with a startup, are they really the ones who can make the big capital decision? Do they know all the parameters that will accelerate this thing? And if they don't, you are in demonstration hell, right? You're just like turning around and as a startup, you're bleeding out. And so you have to actually come up with ways that the demonstrations matter. And that's where I think there are people around um, the insurance industry perhaps, that we don't have enough conversations with earlier about how do we think about risk and what you, what you might do with risk. And one example, um, an um, all iron based flow battery, which is one of my favorite things because it's cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap. They've solved the technical problems. It's called ESS out of, out of Oregon. They actually just announced a few months ago a um, insurance policy with, with Munich Re. And they actually are starting to work their supply chain, build up batteries, so flow batteries for the grid, super important. And they've got this insurance wrapper for 10 years. And so they've reduced some of the risk by bringing on a partner, showing them a certain amount of data, performance data, to get this going. Will they make it? I don't know, but they've changed their risk profile heading into this next space of capital. And the last the piece I wanna show you is one other of my favorite projects that I think will be in market well before 20 years. Can I have the first slide? There it is, up oh, the first slide. Um, so in 2012, um, 2011, 12, Other Lab was given a grant from RPE to do a bellows-based tracker system. So solar, we just heard, solar's big, solar's moving. Um, but they were, ten, solar tends to be single, single, I mean, it's mount, solid mounted, right? It's not on trackers. Because when you put on trackers, it gets complicated. And so this team came to us from Other Lab, which is a, a maker space out in Silicon Valley, with this idea, if you could blow mold plastic bottles, you could blow mold these bellows, You'd use an air actuated system to move your solar panels. Two directional tracker from blow molded bottle technology. And you would cut the cost, you'd cut the maintenance costs. And so we're like, okay, a little crazy, but let's go with this. So this was the actual demonstration that they had just as I was leaving RPE in 2015. And so they um, actually have done a lot of things. They, um, the, the founder, um, Lila, she um, went to Y Combinator and really learned about some of the pieces and thought about scaling up, got a board together, um, brought in a new CEO in 2017, and actually partnered with DuPont since 2015 on the, the materials. So they're using DuPont-based plastics. 
the bellows structures being blow molded and put together in Tennessee. And uh, they got what was the critical demonstration in California based on a dual grant with RPE in the state of California. So again, where public finance came in, right? To do a demonstration of, 30, of 100, yeah, 300 uh, kilowatts in 50 kilowatt installations at the Davis site. And they put that up and they also partnered with DNV to actually analyze the data from this. And so they have like 19 million hours of uptime with 99.9% um, uptime during that process. And they've been able to write a bankability report for them. And in doing so, they now have um, good backstop finance. They have put together their own self-fund. They, they'll actually give 35-year guarantee. And they have an installation partner. And so if the last slide that I have shows them today, this is just pulled from their website. I didn't want to. You can see these trackers. So they're mounted. They have two screws mounting this bellows in on a fixed rack. You can fill your space better. You can do 50% faster installation. You have much lower costs of, um, of maintenance. You're basically changing air filters in your pneumatic air changer. And um, it's really starting to move. They have 60, um, 60 megawatts of backlog um, heading into the quarter now. And so it's a really good story to see in you know, 2012 to, to now how far a company can move. It's still, you know, it's still not a, a big giant yet, but it's this enablement of creatively thinking about the middle of the pipe, getting others involved from state government agencies, insurers, um, different types of financiers involved. And so I think if we extend this ecosystem conversation more and more around the middle of the pipe, who could be involved? Where each of you, based on what you do, could be involved earlier in conversations to help us do better demonstrations that you'd be willing to write a check for, right? There's asset owners. We saw Macquarie Capital come in with their new design studio. They have a venture design studio. They invested in one of the projects for, for Sunfolding because their interest is not the few million dollars it takes to do the demo. They want it to put it against their assets. And so the calculus for them is not a venture return calculus. It's an asset utilization calculus. And so it changes the game. And I think folks like Macquarie are going to start to come in. They've invested in a drone company that can do 4D depictions of, of construction sites, so 3D over time, so you can see flaws and go back and fix these things. So we're improving efficiency. We were talking about building efficiency yesterday. So there is awesome stuff going on. And it can be more awesome and go faster if we don't think linearly about how this comes together but bring it in more and earlier into the conversation about how do we re reduce and manage risk. And because to me, that's all this is about, is the risk return calculus. And anytime it's, you know, it's like managing your portfolio. If you've got something that's non-correlated risk for somebody else, they're going to come in with a different view of what that return is. And perhaps it'll work in your sector or not. Um, but I think it's worth the conversation. And I think we're starting to get there. So thank you. That's terrific. Well. <laughs> I sort of have one question. This is all about new partnerships and new ways of doing things. And Cheryl, you've got us off on the start. And maybe Klaus and Ellen, you could both uh, say, you know, tell us briefly within like a minute what partnerships you're working on that are outside of the traditional university approach. Well, we, uh, you have had me here before, and I talked about direct air capture and the importance. It, it goes exactly to what you said. When I started working on air capture, I said, this is very unlikely to work. But if it works, it's a game changer. And it's a big game changer. And so then I stumbled into this observation that we do win windmills. And if mm -hmm. I price the kinetic energy in the wind at five cents a kilowatt hour, your average cubic kilometer where you put a windmill at six meters a second <laughs> has about $300 worth of kinetic energy. If I give you a tipping fee of $30 a ton of CO2, uh, that same cubic kilometer carries $21,000 worth of CO2. And that, that simple calculus made me say it's worth <laughs> pushing this and work it out. So now I can say we are now working with a group in, in Ireland, who Silicon Kingdom uh, Holdings, they, have, they want to build our particular design. And uh, it's a very innovative way of working together. It's the university who has a stake in them rather than me. So that actually creates 
a, a very new and interesting dynamics, and I think you will see us accelerate in the next few months. We are right in the starting gate situation right now. And their goal is in, in very short time to get to small-scale commercial markets because people do buy CO2 to fill fire extinguishers and feed greenhouses and all sorts of things. And that CO2 is typically worth a lot more than $100 a ton of CO2, but it's a tiny market. And the point I would make, direct air capture, every time it doubled, reduced its cost by 20%. If we can do this too, and Climbworks, one of the competitors in the space, has sort of put a marker up at $500, and maybe the world is at a kiloton. That doubling, every, that doubling being 20% says if you grow a thousand fold, you should be 10 times cheaper. So we should get from 500 below $100 a ton as we go from kilotons per year to megatons per year. Now, I don't want to make predictions what happens as we go from megatons to gigatons, where is where we eventually will have to be because clearly that curve somewhere has to level out. But my, my point is, if we can feed those little commercial markets in the megaton scale, uh, we have a foothold which is actually commercially working, and that's a big accelerator. What now from there to the full scale is huge. Ellen, mm -hmm. some thoughts. So uh, I, I really like that concept of, and, and that's the way we operate and how we operate at Ford, is, is first ask the question, if you're successful, in, in, in your achievement, will it matter? How important is and is this working on the most important thing? You know, as a as a researcher, you know, we've been existing on government grants, like RPE and, and others from the Department of Energy. But in the spirit of you know asking about new partnerships, new partnerships. Uh, more and more we're starting to look at, you know, can we push it out of the lab sooner so we can get on that learning curve? We know it's not perfect yet, but if we can make, mm -hmm. and, and one of the ones we're trying to do is making renewable hydrogen direct from the sun, not from electrolysis, from other ways that we think can uh, be much uh, less capital intensive than electrolysis. But the point is then finding you know, those, we may not be the ones to start a company, but like uh, Klaus found, this Irish group, I guess, is finding the entrepreneurs who are willing to take a little risk because they also believe it is so important, it's worth trying. And so we're doing that with, uh, with water splitting in some new uh, ways uh, in, in trying to push the, uh, the technology out. That's pushing us ourselves way out of our comfort zone. But uh, the only way to learn and grow is to get yourself out of the comfort zone. So, you know, that's really new for us uh, to say, okay, we're going to take uh, the risk sooner and say, it's, let's try to make a, a, a scalable unit that will make hydrogen. And another one is, uh, didn't say it earlier, very important with renewable uh, uh, hydrogen is also renewable ammonia. And I don't mm -hmm. think enough people are working on that. So uh, we've got a DOE grant. If, if we can prove it's possible, we'll try to push that to a company as fast as possible. Yeah. So I just want to say, Ellen said something uh, in her talk that I just wanted to sort of come back and sort of think about, and that is this whole idea of data, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. Uh, you know, Cheryl, what are the possibilities of you know, thinking about how we do partnerships at scale of the kinds of things that you were talking about? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, if we marry up you know, some of these, these hard tech ideas with, with digital I think this is what's going to escalate, right? You're starting to hear about, you know, um, infra tech, right? The digital technologies applied to, to infrastructure. Mm. And again, folks like um, Macquarie, a lot of other asset owners, looking at how and why do they bring these digital technologies in. Or in spaces, um, even in battery storage, there's a, there's a company that was founded after two um, researchers at um, CUNY had run two RPE projects, and they ran into all kinds of problems with predictability on their data based on battery performance. And they've since started this company called Voltaic, with a Q, um, where they actually use machine learning, and, and they just launched a digital twin project, uh, product 
that actually allows them to build up a battery system with the inputs across your, your anode and your cathode and your entire um, bill, um, battery management system and look at what its performance could be and you can change things before you actually go and build that final battery. And so it takes all the data, because battery researchers have a lot of data. And part of the problem sometimes is that they selectively look at some of that data. So I think having a, a system and a, a company that's really looking at and enabling researchers to look faster at a digital twin will make them more effective at moving stuff forward. So I think that's going to accelerate things as well and will bring new partnerships that um, I don't think that historically the wet chemists and the, and the elect electric chemists have partnered as well with the the people who are doing the, the IT systems. And I think that's going to change everything. It's going to change a lot, right. The, 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 there's another reason why I think IT in general and automation specifically will play an enormous role. One of my students was involved in looking at various learning curves for different things. And one of the things we found was an incredibly strong correlation between the size on which you operate Mm -hmm. and the, the, scale, the rate at which you can learn. And by the size, I mean the physical size of individual units. So you, cars are very, very large, large in the terms sense that they are billions, but individually they are tiny compared to power plants. But the learning curve in small things is much faster than in large things. The moment you say that, you are sort of committed to think of these new technologies as being lots of small things, mm -hmm. and you cannot make that work unless you get to an enormous degree of automation. These things have to be self-repairing, these things have to be self-maintaining, and they have to run all the time. If I have a device which collects one ton a day of CO2, I can't have a person keep watch over it because I can't afford that person. That person has to take care of thousands and thousands of units and simultaneously. So I think that's important. And the learning curve, I think, is what will accelerate us. Yeah. When, you, I you, think that as you look at these learning curves coming down and the costs coming down and people's comfort level, we talked about people adopting technology. I think there's some really cool things out there. Like there's some new experiments, uh, new demonstrations going on. The company, I think it's called P3. And they actually have a unit you can buy and put in your car. And it actually sends signals ahead of you. Like it's a two-way, you know, you use it for tolls today. When you drive through the toll booths, just know, and they know who you are and they send you your bill. But two-way communication on that same technology would allow cars to actually move. It, the, the street knows where you are. Eventually, you could eliminate street signs. But the buy-in for people today is that it, if you're part of these test systems, it will know where you are. Um, traffic lights could last longer if you're one of the people who are in the, in the, you know, the green lane. Or there could be special, rather than have special lanes, you actually have special automated devices. And the Internet of Things starts to behave differently to you. Yep. But you could think about how it could help with reducing energy consumption, um, congestion, a lot of these things. Yep. But it also would be an incentive to adopt. And so I think there's places here where some of these technologies and getting at what matters to individuals to use them will enable us to get people to buy into what is the bigger system that's going to enable us to get to these negative carbon pieces. Because yep. honestly, I think, I mean, heck, I have a hard time getting my head around it some days about what would it actually mean to, to capture some of these things and where we're going to put them and is this dangerous or not. And like, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of complexity to this. And even as legacy scientists, um, I, can't, I can't say that just telling the story about what we must do is going to get us there. Right. And so I've got to come up with what matters to everybody so they'll want to take all of us there. Right. Yes. Yeah, I, so I think there's this issue of sort of making sure that we get your ideas about how we collectively can do this. And so you've heard some great uh, ideas from panelists who have worked with partnerships, who are working with new technology, who are, I'm going to say, partnering as they go, as mm -hmm. opposed to doing it the traditional ways. So what I'd encourage all of you to do is to seek out these people on the panel. Uh, tell us your ideas ask your questions, and then what I will do is come back to each one of the panelists up here and sort of collaborate, uh, you know, and sort of bring back these concepts. And then, you know, at our day, uh, part of what we're doing is, uh, you know, creating ideas here, but what's important is what happens the next day, what happens in a month from now, and so you are part of that as a result of coming here to our day. So I just want to thank you for the time, uh, you know, to listen to us and thank my panelists. Uh, for their contributions to this important discussion about how we get to net 
zero. And yeah. net negative. <laughs> and, and, and learning by doing and learning requires by doing. doing. Yes. Otherwise, we won't do it. <laughs> All right. Or well, learn. Yeah. Well, our time is out. Uh, learning by and doing. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>